Hello, uh, I've got chapter 20 of Barnaby, Barnaby Rocket today. We're getting very close to the end, but I don't think we'll finish it before we come back to school. But that's okay, because we'll finish it off next week. So chapter 20 is Stanley's wish list. Um, ah, do you remember last time? They were in Africa. They'd fallen asleep and woken up in Africa. Six months, said Stanley the following afternoon as they made their way towards the Zambezi River where the old man had an appointment scheduled for 12 noon precisely. Does that seem like a long time to you? A very long time, said Barnaby, who was only eight years old after all, so six months accounted for one sixteenth of his life to date. It's a blink of an eye, that's all, replied Stanley, but it's all I've got left. Barnaby stared at him, uncertain if the old man meant what he thought he meant. You're dying? he asked hesitantly. That's right. Two months ago, the doctors gave me eight months to live, so I must be down to six now. I'd been having these terrible headaches, you see, so I had them checked out and they said there was nothing they could do for me. My number's up and I said, well, if that's the case... Then hell's bells, I'm going to live the way I want to live before I die. Is that what brought you to Ireland? In a manner of speaking, I spent all my life working, built up one of the biggest businesses in America, never took a day off, never did a thing I wanted, focused all the time on being on top, being number one, getting richer than the next guy. So when I found that I was on my way out, I thought if I don't do something for myself now, then I never will. I made a list and started to tick things off one by one. My family, family came from Ireland originally and I'd never been back. So that's where I was last week when I saw that freak show circus. I tell you, Barnaby, I just about dropped dead right there in anger at the way you people were being treated and swore that I'd save you all. And I did too. But that's not all. Over the last couple of months, I've scuba dived off the Great Barrier Reef, walked a tightrope across Niagara Falls, abseiled down the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur and run with the bulls in Spain. And now I'm on my way, we're on our way, to the Victoria Falls Bridge for the world's biggest bungee jump. After that, I plan to do a parachute jump. What do you think of that? You think I'm crazy? No, of course not. Stanley smiled and shook his head. I wish everyone had such an open mind, he said. My family say that I've gone gaga. Completely Looney Tunes, crazier than a coyote in a chicken coop. They even tried to get me locked up. Here I am with only a few months left and they want me to spend my last days in some god-awful nursing home, getting bed baths every day. How's that for a way to go? I told them hell's bells, just you, just me, just let me have my fun. But they wouldn't have it. They say it's not normal to be doing things like this at my time of life. What's normal, I asked them. This, they said, pointing at their own sorry lives. So I'm on the run. If they catch up with me, I'm toast. But don't you miss them? asked Barnaby. They are your family, after all. Sure I miss them, said Stanley. I miss them every time of day. But I've spent my whole life in a three-piece suit. I've done what was expected of me. I've crushed my competitors and outfoxed my rivals. And do you know something? I haven't enjoyed a single minute of it. But these last two months, pure pleasure. Every day. Now look ahead, Barnaby, my boy. Here we are. They were standing close to a deep gorge on the Zambian side of the river. The Victoria Falls Bridge stretched out before them, a magnificent construct of shimmering steel, in the centre of which stood the platform from which bungee jumpers made their leaps. They headed towards the platform, where a group of volunteers were helping to tie the harnesses. They looked at the old man and the boy and scratched their heads. Don't tell me I'm too old, snapped Stanley, fixing them with a gaze that was as steely as the bridge they were standing on. And don't tell me I'm too young, added Barnaby, who wasn't going to allow himself to be left out of this adventure. The bungee assistants shrugged their shoulders and strapped the cords around the old man's legs as Barnaby held on to the side of the bridge to stop himself from floating away. 
Here goes nothing, said Stanley, as he leapt off the platform and fell 364 feet into the ravine, coming so close to the rocks and river below that Barnaby almost shouted out in horror. A moment later, he bounced back up, went down again, came back up again, down again, up again, over and over, until he was simply bobbing in the air, at which point he was dragged back to where he'd started. Hell's bells, cried Stanley in delight, taking the goggles off. His thin, air was, his thin hair was spread out at extraordinary angles, giving him a rather demented appearance. If my kids could see the fun I'm having, they'd understand. What about it, Barnaby? You want to have a go? Absolutely, said Barnaby, allowing the volunteers to tie the cord around him now. He made his way to the edge of the platform, looked down, took a deep breath and jumped. However, he only descended a couple of dozen feet before he started rising again, until the bungee cord was extended vertically into the clouds, with Barnaby at the end of it looking down rather than sinking into the gorge gorge below. We should have seen that coming, said the old man, turning to explain things to the astonished people on the platform. Kid refuses to obey the law of gravity. Better reel him in again. A few minutes later, Barnaby was winched back down and Stanley gave him his own bag to carry as it held enough of his travelling gear to keep him grounded. Sorry about that, Barnaby, he said, but I don't think the bungee is for you. Maybe we'll have more luck with a parachute. A private plane was waiting on a nearby runway and they took off into the skies while a couple of instructors strapped parachutes to their backs. This is the big one, said Stanley, rubbing his hands together in glee as they ascended into the clouds. The second last thing on my list. Once I do this and then I do that, I'm through. You're, you ready, Barnaby? Ready, said Barnaby, and they jumped out within seconds of each other. Stanley sailed through the air, heading towards the ground and pulling the cord of his parachute at exactly the right moment. Barnaby, however, fell no more than 10 seconds before floating right back up again, at which point the plane circled around him with the door open until he could tumble back inside. I don't think parachuting is for me either, he said to Stanley when they were safely on the ground. Hell's bell, son, at least you gave it a try, said the old man. That night, tired after their day's adventures, Barnaby and Stanley made their way through a forest, looking for a clearing in the trees. When I was a boy, explained Stanley as they walked along, I always wanted to go camping and sleep out under the stars, but my dad, he was a railroad man, had to work every day and night to put food on the table, so I never got the chance, and when I had children of my own, I planned on taking them camping, but somehow work always got in the way big mistake on my part. So this is it, Barnaby, the last thing on my list, a night out camping under the stars. It'd be nice if my dad was here to share with me, or my son, but one's long gone and the other's trying to have me locked up. So it's just you and me. What do you say? You up for it? Barnaby grinned and nodded his head happily. He was wearing a third unopened parachute that the pilot had given him, which was so heavy that it was not only keeping him fairly, firmly on the ground, but even making it a little difficult to walk. It didn't take long for them to find a comfortable place to spend the night, and they threw a couple of waterproof mats on the ground and lay down, staring up at the stars. These were the same stars, Barnaby thought, that Captain W.E. Johns would be looking at now if he was outside in the back garden on private business. You're really going to go back to your family tomorrow, asked Barnaby as they drifted off to sleep. I have to, said the old man, sounding a little sad, but resigned to the inevitable. I've done all the things I wanted to do, and when I go, I'd rather go with the people I love by my side than in some country I don't know, all on my own. They'll be glad to have me back, but they won't understand why I had to do all these things. I'm happy, though, and how many people can say that at the end, that at the end of their days? Barnaby thought about this as he fell asleep and he was so tired that he didn't even feel it when a fox appeared from out of the woods and chewed so hard at the cords of his parachute that he was able to drag it away into the forest where he could dig his way to the centre on what would be an unsuccessful forage for food and he didn't notice when he drifted off the ground rising up beside the trees as he floated into the night sky which was empty now except for the stars and the moon in the distance. 
Barnaby floated like this for a long time and when he finally opened his eyes again he was astonished to see that he was no longer lying on the ground. In fact he couldn't even see the clearing anymore or the old man or the trees that surrounded them. When he looked down he could make out the rivers and mountain ranges they had passed by earlier and then he had floated some more and he realised that the shape he was looking down on was the outline of the African continent itself, so much bigger than he realised in comparison to the other continents, bigger than it was ever shown on maps. With the South Atlantic Ocean flowing along on the left, he looked further north and east towards the great landmass of Asia, and knew that as the world turned, he might even be able to make out the familiar shape of Australia. But how could he ever get back down to it, he wondered. He had never floated so far off the ground before. There had always been someone to catch him or something to hit his head on and stop him from drifting a, a, any further up. But not this time. Now he was just an eight year old boy floating away from planet Earth into the darkness of the night sky and the mysteries of what lay beyond. I'll never get home again, thought Barnaby, feeling the tears forming in his eyes. And I'll never have any more adventures. Then. Looking into the darkness, he thought he saw a small white dot in the distance in the very direction in which he was floating. He blinked and yawned, for the atmosphere was so different up here that it was difficult to stay awake. And he wondered whether he was drifting towards a star, and if so, should he be worried? Had he read somewhere that they were made of white fire if he collided with one, then he would probably be burned to a crisp. But there was nothing he could do about it. He continued to float closer to the white dot, which then turned into two dots, one considerably larger than the other, but connected by what looked like a long white rope. He waved his arms, his eyelids growing heavier and heavier, his body desperate for sleep, and turned towards it just as the smaller white dot appeared to turn in his direction and wave back. An astronaut, thought Barnaby sleepily. A spaceship! His eyes could stay open no longer, and the last thing he remembered before he passed out was an enormous pair of arms wrapping themselves around him and pulling him through the atmosphere towards the safety of the ship ahead. Wow, Barnaby's adventure is getting more and more out of this world, isn't it? So there we go. He's gone from Africa to space. Well, we'll have to find out what happens to him next time.